You're listening to the Love Over Addiction Podcast. Hey. Okay, so right now I am pulled over in a parking lot. I just got myself some Starbucks and I want to talk to you. I am going to be very, very, very real with you for this podcast. Um, I'm normally, you guys, I'm always very real. I'm the girl in the room that talks about the things that nobody in the room wants to talk about or would dare talk about. That's always been me, which makes an awesome party guest. Um, But this is so fresh. Normally when stuff happens to me in my life, I use it for this podcast and I always put it from the perspective of addiction, but I've processed it. I've sat with it. I've molded over. I've researched it. And then I've kind of presented it to you as something to learn from because I've learned from it. But this episode just literally happened to me about 10 minutes ago. And it set me on fire and it might not be well polished, but here we go anyways. And it's super vulnerable. And it's actually funny because it's a podcast about vulnerability. So here we go. Um, I have a relationship with my father and my parents are divorced. And my father is this incredibly wise Englishman who is brilliant and a little crusty and a little prickly sometimes, but also can be incredibly encouraging and loving and thoughtful, which has really presented a lot of complications and mixed messages for me my entire childhood. And it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I'm okay with it. And how I got to the point where I was okay with the relationship with my dad was recognizing Um, And it only took me about 40 years to get there just because there, you know, you have this fantasy in your head that your family members are going to all love each other and get along. And you're going to be one of those families that, you know, play games together on Christmas Eve and all live close to one another. Like every one of us probably has a friend that's family is like that, but that is not my truth. It's not my reality of my situation. And the moment that I let go and kind of surrendered that fantasy made peace with the actual family I had allowed me to have really strong, clear boundaries with my family members. Um, I've always spoken up and spoken my mind, surprise. And, um, that always doesn't make for, uh, the best situations. And so, um, especially with people who don't like talking about things, which tends to be my family, I'm kind of makes me the black sheep. I deeply feel things on a tremendously sensitive level. And I like talking about all things. I'm fine with conflict. I'm great with going deep and all that stuff. When you have family members that don't operate in that space, it can be weird right? So anyways, I've protected myself by creating these boundaries and recognizing that, hey, listen, you're just a little different from your family members and they love you and you love them, but that doesn't mean that you need to call them all the time or spend every holiday with them. And that worked for me for a really long time. For many years, um, I have been good with that. But um, the virus, this coronavirus my dad lives, um, in a very big city and, um, I've been worried about him. So I, he's 80 and his health is, you know, not great. So I've been calling him every day, which placed me in a very interesting situation. Cause I'm like, I've worked so hard to have these boundaries in place and I'll call maybe once or twice, uh, a month to check in. Um, keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it thoughtful, keep it positive. But now with the virus, I was feeling led that I needed to check in every day. And um, it actually became a very nice relationship. 
Um, and I was like, huh, maybe this is like, maybe I've been wrong. Maybe I don't need to protect myself as much as I need to. Maybe he's changed. Maybe I've changed. Um, and so I let my guard down. I let my walls down and I just called him because something's going on in my life that I feel pretty insecure about. And I had this panic attack about it. I don't often suffer from panic attacks, but I was telling him about this panic attack that I had on the side of the street. And um, I was embarrassed about it. And I actually clarified before I started the story saying, hey, I'm about to tell you something. I feel incredibly embarrassed. I feel like I was being, I'm overreacting and I'm being too dramatic. Um, this reaction that I had a panic attack was too dramatic, but I need to talk about this. I want to talk about this with you. So I go into detail, not too much about why I had this panic attack. And I said, and I don't know, I feel so, uh, embarrassed. You know, I was with my friend and my poor friend was like, what the heck is going on with you, Michelle, in a very loving way. Um, but like almost grabbed her phone thinking she needed to like call 911 because I couldn't breathe. And I said, I don't know what, why I reacted this way. And my dad said to me on the phone, he goes, well, Michelle, I know exactly why you reacted this way. And I was like, great. Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Like so insightful. Why? And he said, it's because when you were four, my, your mom and I took you to a therapist and they said, the therapist said, I've never met a girl in all of the years of my practice who is so kind and so nice, but also is so dramatic. Now, for those of you out there listening that are empaths like me and feel things deeply, I know you probably just felt my pain. It felt like I got punched in the gut. It was like, wait, what? So I, what was I, A, doing in therapy of four? That's what I, that's news to me. Um, And number two, that's the response. Like I'm opening up to you about something so vulnerable and worried that I'm being overdramatic and you're basically confirming (laughs) that I am an overdramatic person since I was four. Oh my gosh, you guys, it really stung. It hurt like hell. And he went on and on and on and on for another 20 minutes. And I honestly, I couldn't even hear what he was saying because I was still parked on that. And I went through a series of emotions and I'm sure you guys can relate because oftentimes when we're married to loved ones who suffer from addiction, they hurt us with their words too, or they hurt us with their actions. And when you're hurt, someone's hurt you, if you're, you naturally are feisty, or if you've naturally had to fend for yourself most of your life or defend yourself, um, you get defensive immediately. You know, it hurts. You're like, ouch. And then you 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 start, you know, thinking they're wrong. And then after you kind of get defensive and pissed off, you kind of move into that fear where it's like, wait a second, are they right? Like, is this criticism that they're offering me or what they're saying? Is there any truth to that? And a lot of times, you know, we really should take a look at that and, and say like, is there a grain of truth? Is there a lesson here I need to learn? So I went into that stage as my dad's going on and on. I'm thinking, gosh, am I over dramatic? Is that is that a defining like characteristic of myself? Am I melodramatic? Am I an ex- extreme exaggerator? Do I create drama? I don't you know, is that, is there truth? And I started looking back in my life and looking back in the last five years and how I parent and how I wife and how I friend. And then, so you, you, you start to feel, you know, fear that what they said is correct. And then y'all, I moved into a stage of shame where I was like, oh my gosh, I am the most dramatic person I've ever heard of. I am, you know, too feeling too much all the time. I do make mountains out of molehills, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. 
And then I caught myself. I politely hung up the phone. I ended the conversation. Um, Not before I said, which is, I'm so proud of myself. Before I hung up, I said in a very loving way, you know, I, I don't think the whole dramatic thing is accurate. I think a better, uh, I said, actually using the word dramatic is quite hurtful. I said, I think a more appropriate, healthier choice of words, and especially for a four-year-old, would have been, um, she feels a lot. She feels deeply. She's very empathetic to people around her. Um, that would have been a kinder, nicer thing to say. Um, but I'll definitely take it under consideration. And then I got off the phone. So it wasn't huffing and puffing. I didn't curse him out. I didn't get defensive. I And I didn't take it on either. Like I wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I'm such a bad kid. I didn't do that either. So then I hang up the phone. I st- I'm still feel like so upset, hurt, um, broken. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to go through Starbucks and get myself a coffee. And I'm waiting in the Starbucks line. And I was thinking about it. And I was like, you know, Michelle, you are 40 freaking two years old. You have lived a particularly difficult life. You've gone through a lot. Why do you have to own his opinion or this random therapist's opinion of when you were a little girl? Why do you need to let that destroy your day? Why do you need to take that on? Why do I need to, you know, now spend the rest of my months or weeks or hours or days thinking, am I being dramatic? Is this, you know, do I belong on a soap opera? Like, why can't I just sit there and go, "Mm, that doesn't ring true to me. I'm actually quite proud of who I am. I'm actually pretty proud and impressed with what I've overcome. I love the relationships that I have with people. And I think the people that I have in my life like my relationship with them. And I'm going to dismiss this. I'm actually going to disagree kindly, but strongly and firmly say, nope, I am not going to own that. You can take it back. I'm giving that claim back to you. And that's what I'm going to do. This is, I don't have to, at this age in my life, allow other people's opinions of me to run my life or to delegate how I choose to behave. I can, I'm old enough and wise enough and smart enough to hear it, ask if I need to, what I should do with it. And then make an adult decision. And so can you. So can you. So when you're being verbally abused, and I know a lot of you out there are and have been in your childhood by a lot of you out there have been raised by alcoholics or are in a marriage or even friendships with unkind people, you get to choose. Because if you're old enough to be listening to this, you're old enough to make up your own mind about how you feel about yourself. You're old enough to decide your own identity. You're old enough to say, all right, here's my makeup. Yeah, I feel deeply. But you know what? That actually allows me to be a freaking amazing friend because I feel other people's pain on a deeper level than most. Therefore, I can say or listen with uttermost compassion and empathy. Um, I can write for me. I write for a living. I can write with total sincerity because it's not just fluff and, 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 you know, pie in the sky, scientific, theoretical stuff. It's, it's, it's a heart issue. I can speak from the heart. I can come from a deep place in my soul. And for me, and I'm not saying this is for everyone, thank God everyone isn't like me, but for me, I'd rather live there in that deep place and feel everything than be a person who feels nothing. And I know a lot of people who don't feel anything and we need those people. Those people help round us out. But but I'm not going to take on the 
label of dramatic. I'm going to take that on as somebody who um, uses all her feelings to help others and help herself and help her kids and help love um, on a daily basis. And so what are you or what have you been told? What labels have you applied to your life? What have you been told that you are still carrying around? Literally say it out loud right now. I know you guys have those messages. I know that there are things, negative things that you've been called or people have accused you of that you need to drop that and you need to let it go and go, nope. There's a thing in a a wonderful tool in a Brene Brown uh, book. I believe it's her Dare to Lead book that uh, I did. It's an exercise and I encourage you to do it too. I've mentioned it before. Uh, I think I mentioned it in the Stay or Go program. Um, Take a piece of paper, a little tiny piece of paper. I think she said two by four. um, And write down the list of people whose opinion you should care about. And it, the, the, the whole purpose and attention behind it is that it's an incredibly small piece of paper because it should only be an incredibly small amount of people. It, it really should only be one to four people. If you've got four, you are, you are blessed, right? That you have four true people in your life who will be honest with you, but who will love you and their opinion matters. I remember Oprah doing an interview with Brene Brown one time and uh, Brene was actually interviewing Oprah and Oprah said, I have three people in my life whom I go to for their opinion. Nobody, nobody else. And this is Oprah guys. Oprah knows everybody. Like Oprah knows more people than anyone else in the entire world. I don't know if that's true, but you get my point. Um, dude, she could have like a, a master scroll of like thousands of people, presidents and dignitaries and self-help gurus. Her boyfriend or her partner, I'm sorry, that's not mature of me to call her boyfriend, but she's not married. Um, her partner, Stedman, is on the list. Her best friend, Gail, is on the list. And then <laughs> she calls him her brother from another mother, Bob Green, who started out as her personal trainer and is her neighbor. Um, is her, is on the list. That's it. So if Oprah only has three people, you and I, we, we, four would be amazing. So be, uh, be, what's the word I'm looking for? Be diligent, be cutthroat, be real and ask yourself, who am I going to choose to be vulnerable with? And who am I going to allow to give me labels? to reflect back to me who I am in the world today and, and, um, who's going to treat my thoughts and feelings with tender care, with love and appreciation. And, um, but also give me the truth. Maybe it's, you know, I had a conversation with a girlfriend today and she's like, Michelle, what I'm about to say might make you upset. And of course it didn't at all. I was so grateful. Um, but she was telling me something that she thought would be hard for me to hear. And because I valued her, because I, I love her, because I trust her, it wasn't hard to hear at all. I, I really entirely agreed with everything she said. And it, it wasn't about me. Um, so who's on your list? Make your list. Be super, super diligent um, and picky. And what labels are you, um, are sticking to you? Think about yourself. Like if you're standing in a room and, um, you're dressed, but you have sticky notes, you know, those like yellow post-it notes, every post-it note on your body is a label that you've been carrying around. Maybe since you were little, what do those post-it notes say? Take inventory. I hope some of them are good and ask yourself, okay, what post-it notes do I need to peel off, rip up and throw away? Because they're just not true. And also ask yourself, who is responsible for putting that sticky note on you? And is that a good thing to have that person in your life still? Or do you need to put up your boundaries 
maybe you can't get rid of them entirely because they're a family member you have to see, or maybe they're your partner and you're not ready to leave right now. Um, maybe, you know, you're contemplating leaving, but you're hoping you don't have to. And so you live with them and you're married to them. Well, put up boundaries with them. You guys, you can still live with someone and have very, very healthy boundaries with your loved one that can prevent you from getting hurt all the time, right? We can't turn to, particularly if they're suffering from addiction, you can't turn to a hurt person to make you feel better. And you sure as heck can't rely on a sick person to help you define who you are. They can't even define themselves right then. They're sick. They're filled with addiction. They don't think clearly. So if there's some sticky notes that you got to remove of things that they've said to you, remove them. You are a grown up. You get to choose what sticky notes stay on you. And hopefully they're all good. And then you can really pay attention to those labels and honor your soul and yourself and who you are. Because here's the deal. This is the other thing that occurred to me the other day. I'm 42. Most likely, my son was reminding me of this. Um, he's a teenager, y'all. I am halfway done, more than halfway done with my life. The average expectant rate um, for a woman, he told me this, so if this is wrong, I'm sorry. I'm getting my, <laughs> I'm getting my, my information from a 19-year-old boy. But um, is 76, he said, for women? Um, I know it's in the 70s, so we're not close. I mean, we are close. But you guys, my life is more than halfway over. I don't want to spend the next half of my life feeling as crappy as I did about myself the first part of my life. I would love to walk into the second part of my life and be joyful and be happy and be proud of who I am. Quit being afraid of you know, making people upset or worried about what people think about me and own my labels and go, hell yeah, I am really empathetic. And that's a good thing. It's not always easy to feel everything all the time, but I'm going to stick with that. I'm not going to run away from that or try to change that. I like that about myself. So what do you like about yourself, guys? What are you proud of? What labels are you sitting there going, I, I am not changing that. I'm going to celebrate that. I'm dyslexic. I cannot spell worth a darn. And I'm a writer for a living. How is that possible? Spell check. Thank God for Bill Gates creating spell check. I'm not going to sit around embarrassed that I write for a living but can't spell. No. That makes me, my dyslexia helps me think outside the box. It makes me actually a more creative writer. I'm not going to be embarrassed about it. So label me dyslexic and label me proud. Okay, guys, this is part of our growth. Let's spend the second half of our life or even the rest of your life, if you're not in the second stage, working on really celebrating you and, and making sure that the only people we're really caring about how they feel about us is those people on that little little piece of paper. If you are in our secret Facebook group, um, those women are absolutely uh, rock stars. And I use that word intentionally because I think that's one word, right guys? I'm dyslexic, so <laughs> just don't ask me how to spell it. It's one word, rock stars, right? Anyways, whatever. Point is, you guys, those women... What they say, how they care about, they are the real deal. They should, be, what, that secret Facebook group should be one of the things on your small little list because they get you like nobody else. When you share what you're going through, every single person can go, yep, me too. We feel that right on, sister. You are okay. It is perfectly fine to say exactly that. You are not wrong. They all raise their hands. They all clap for you. They are your biggest encourager and cheering you on. So put that secret Facebook group community on that list because a lot of times we have loving people in our world, but when you're married to somebody with struggles from addiction, they don't get it. 
they'll offer you well-intentioned crappy advice because they're comparing your relationship to theirs and it's vastly different. So make sure if you are a part of that community that you add those ladies there. Be vulnerable with us because we will hold your feelings um, and make space for them in such a safe way. So that's it for today. I feel very nervous that I was so forthcoming with you. It's very nerve wracking when you're super real, but screw it, right? We're going to do this together. I've always been honest with you. Why would I stop now? All right. I love you guys and um, hang in there. I'm cheering for you. Hey, okay. One more thing for this episode because I drove home and then I thought about you guys and I was like, you know what? I need to tell them one more thing. All right. Listen, this is the truth. Nobody in this world walking on this planet is going to tell you how great you are except for you. Now, you might get compliments from other people and you might get loving reminders, but they're not going to stick because really truthfully, if you are looking for self-confidence and don't we all need some, during this time, right? If you are looking for true self-confidence, like the kind that you own, the kind that cannot be rocked or shaken or taken away from you, the kind that when the poo hits the fan, I wish I could swear on this podcast. I feel like I should, I want to, but I know there are kids listening and I just can't do that. But when, you know, Times are tough. That unshakable confidence that you are building a foundation on cannot be ripped away from you. If you want that kind of confidence, then you're going to have to give it to yourself. It can't rely on anything anyone's told you. It can't rely on what I'm, what your therapist is saying. It can't rely on, you know, Uh, what your mom, the pep talk your mom's giving you, that's temporarily feels good, but lasting confidence has to come from you. So here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you that the fact that you are listening to me right now, that you have listened to this podcast makes you more determined than millions and millions of other people walking this planet. So you can label yourself determined. You can say, I am determined. I am a determined person. The other thing you can do is you can say, I am the glue that holds my family together. Because you are. You're the steady, sober one. You're the one that's looking for resources to make things better. You're the one doing the research. You're the one that's trying to make everybody happy, almost to the point of, you know, unhealthiness, but, and detriment to your own health, but you are the glue. You are the reliable one. You are the rock. You are strong because you can't, Be those things in your family. You can't play that role and be weak. So you can say with confidence, I am strong and I am the glue. That's another thing you can tell yourself. You can also say, I am a freaking survivor. I am a survivor because guess what? You are surviving right now, no matter how bad you think your relationship is with your loved one suffering from addiction, you are surviving it. You're not dying from it. You're waking up every day. Whether you think you have a good day or a bad day doesn't matter. You're still alive. Your heart is still beating. Your your blood is still pumping through your veins. You, my friend, are a survivor. And guess what? Because you are so determined, because you are the glue, and because you are a survivor, you're going to get through this. And you're going to come out of this even stronger. 
with more confidence, with more courage, knowing exactly who you are and you cannot be shaken. And the time is coming and it's very close where you are going to start feeling better and better and better and your decisions are going to be coming healthier and healthier and they're going to honor you and your spirit and your soul and everything around you and you're going to start to glow and people will go, what What are you doing differently? Is it your hair? Is your, Are you eating better? And you're going to think, no, it's that I am becoming who I was born to be. I am starting to feel exactly how I've wanted and dreamed of feeling all of my life. And why? Because you are doing the work and because you know, you know that you are worth this, that you are not going to give up, that you are not going to settle, that you are not having a pity party, that you are not some victim and martyr that just wants to feel sorry for herself. Screw that. Screw that. That's what I said today in the car in the drive through of Starbucks. There's something alive within me and within you that's screaming, saying, no, 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 no. You don't deserve to feel this crappy about yourself. You deserve to feel good. You've done too much work. You're too wonderful of a human being. Look at that. Celebrate that. Don't pay attention to the noise and the darkness and the yuckies because you know what? Other people are screwed up and their agendas have nothing to do with you. They, they're sick in their own way and that's none of your concern nor none of your business. You just focus on you. All right? Did you find this pep talk helpful? I'm fired up today and I wanted to pass it on to you because we're in this together. The thing is, the work doesn't end. Just because you leave them like I did, if you do, it doesn't mean your life is so wonderful and you'll never survive or never go through anything again. No, here's what it means. It means this relationship and this heartache is preparing you for the rest of your life so that you can master these skills and tools. And when life tries to kick you down and when you start to get upset or worried or concerned or feel like what happened to me today, you can call on those skills that you mastered while loving someone with addiction and go, uh, yeah, I've been here. I remember this feeling. And here's what I did to turn it around. I don't have to stumble in the darkness anymore, reading a ton of hundred books or, you know, talking to a dozen people about their opinion about what I should do or how I should feel. You know the answers. Why? Because you figured it out already. And that is the blessing of addiction. And that is the blessing that you have that a lot of other people don't have. Another way of looking at this relationship that's come into your life while loving someone with addiction is you could look at it and go, I feel sorry for the people that don't get to experience this because they don't have anything that fast forwards their emotional growth that forces them to make peace and not only make peace, but be overjoyed with who they are. A lot of people just coast. A lot of people don't really get it and don't feel alive and don't know who the hell they are. You are given an opportunity. This relationship is your opportunity to celebrate and be the person you were meant to be for the rest of your entire life. So maybe we look at people who don't love somebody with addiction and go, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry for them because I'm on a fast track here. I'm on a fast track to feeling good and creating the life that I deserve, that I want, that I need that I have always dreamed of. Okay, I promise. That is it for me today. I love you. I hope you got something out of this. If you got one, maybe two things, I think it's successful. And um, I will talk to you later. Okay, bye guys. This podcast is created for your support, encouragement, and entertainment with Michelle's personal thoughts and beliefs. From one woman to another, bonded together by the fact we love someone suffering from addiction. This is not intended as a substitute for therapy or advice from a professional.